So it has been a huge week for phones here on Tech Radar. Uh, first of all, we got the OnePlus 8 series, and then it was followed up by the much anticipated return of the iPhone SE. Four years in the making, it has finally turned up. So while we are stuck in lockdown, the tech world is still turning, which is great news, and we're going to dig in right now. John, you reviewed the OnePlus 8 Pro. Uh, but give us an overview about what actually landed. Absolutely, yes. I did have the OnePlus 8 Pro. I still have the OnePlus 8 Pro in all its uh, glacial green glory. Um, this was one of two phones OnePlus announced alongside the OnePlus 8. Uh, and the 8 Pro is probably the jewel in the crown. It's its most accomplished flagship phone to date. Uh, and it's a proper flagship. Uh, OnePlus hasn't really cut any corners this time. It has in the past to achieve a lower price tag than sort of the big name flagships, cut a couple of corners, nothing major, but you know, a few noticeable things such as a, a full HD display or no wireless charging, things like that. Uh, but this time around, it's gone all out full fat with the Pro. It's also its most expensive handset to date, but it is still coming in cheaper than the likes of the Galaxy S20 Plus, the Huawei P40 Pro, and the iPhone 11 Pro, which are basically its direct rivals. So it still has a slight price difference, uh, which may play to its advantage, but it's not as big a golf as OnePlus fans historically have maybe been used to and sort of looking at the price of this new handset may be a bit steep for those diehard fans, but it is a very, very good device. It's got a great display, 120 hertz, QHD+, plus. it's smooth, it's fluid, it's crisp, it's clear, HDR10+, plus. it has um, extra video enhancements as well for when you're watching um, Prime Video, YouTube, Netflix and the likes, uh, which enhances the video content. It can also uh, increase the frame rate to take advantage of that 120 hertz display for more smooth and fluid movement. It can look a little bit odd, especially if there's a lot of people movement in shots. People seem to be moving a little too smoothly, which seems a little unnatural, but you can turn this uh, setting on and off and it is fun to play with and it does make for some quite stunning visual. That frame rate changing, is that automatic? Is it like done artificially? Yes. Okay, so it's not like it's not finding another mode, it's actually making it, it's doing it all on, cat on device, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and to be fair to it, it's, it's really impressive what it's able to do real time processing on device. It, it does work. Yeah. It won't be everyone's cup of tea visually, yeah. um, but you've, you've got to take your hat off and, and say, you know, that that is well done. They've ditched the pop up camera from the 7 Pro and the 7T series. They've gone with uh, the Pro, uh, which makes more space inside the phone, makes it lighter and means there's uh, not a mechanical movement to potentially break so easily. So, yeah. Um, the pop-up was fun, but you know, long terms wise, probably not the most sensible thing to have on a device, which tends to get knocked around a bit. Plenty of power under the hood as well. Uh, Snapdragon 865 Qualcomm's top shelf uh, chipset, which is found in the US version of the Galaxy S20 series, among many other flagship phones. So plenty of power. They've got the RAM to um, back it up as well. You get eight gig of RAM with 128 gig of storage or 12 gig of RAM with 256 gig of storage. Uh, I mean, that's an insane amount of RAM for, for any device, especially a smartphone, but it does mean that you have the longevity of this device. It's also 5G, as is the OnePlus 8. So both of these devices have got a top spec chipset, they've got 5G, they've got plenty of RAM, they've got a decent amount of storage, although no expandable storage, but it means that they should keep running fine for the next few years. Um, without too much of an issue. So that would be nice in terms of people looking to make an investment, especially as 5G networks roll out even more over the next couple of years and you can take advantage of better download speeds. So we've obviously been reviewing phones for many, many, many years. Um, you, what, do you miss the mechanical pop-up camera? Because obviously that was one of the funnest things we played with when we had the Oppo, it was the Find X, wasn't it, when we, that first turned up? Like, I know you love that. Do you, do you miss it or are you glad that it's now punch hole? I miss it in terms of it was fun and it was something a bit different in the camera world, in the camera world, in the phone world, in fact, uh, where all our phones these days are relative rectangles with, which are all screen on the front and a large camera block on the back. So a point of differentiation is nice, but in terms of putting thinking sensibly, it is for the best actually to get rid of that moving mechanism just because it's something that always seemed like it was easy to break. Yeah. Um, and to be fair, um, people are sort of are divided a bit on the punch hole, but day-to-day -day usage, you sort of forget it's there. It doesn't really actually get in the way. It sits in the notification bar uh, most of the time, so it's out of the way naturally, and apps tend to do well to avoid it. Um, sometimes a black bar will be put just across the top to sort of hide the camera, but that's okay because it's a 
19.8 by 9 screen, so it's really quite tall anyway. So a lot of apps aren't necessarily optimized for that sort of height just yet anyway. So it still works nicely. And one of the things I'm interested in, obviously, you, you've you been using the OnePlus phones pretty much throughout the series. If we didn't have the OnePlus 8 Pro, right, and, it, and OnePlus had just done the OnePlus 8, would you say it still qualifies as a flagship killer? I wouldn't necessarily say that they could. I mean, the flagship killer tagline, we sort of poo-pooed from about OnePlus 2 onwards. It's not quite the right terminology. Yeah. And I wouldn't say it's necessarily a killer, but they can can now hold their own against Samsung and Apple and Huawei, et cetera. Yeah. Um, the OnePlus 8 is still a very good phone. I've not personally been able to use it, but uh, two of our colleagues both have them, uh, and you can read our in-depth review on the site. Um, but it's still a, an accomplished phone. It has the specs that you'd expect to see from a phone which is costing you know, a flagship price tag. And the cameras aren't quite as good on the OnePlus 8 versus the Pro. And the cameras, the four cameras on the Pro are a marked improvement over the previous generations, but they're still not quite up to Samsung levels. So while the Samsung and the iPhone and the Huawei are still a touch more expensive, they are a touch better as well. Um, so while OnePlus hasn't compromised the weak point, and which seems harsh to say because as an all-round package, it's very good. The cameras aren't quite up to the levels that we've seen from the bigger manufacturers at the moment, but they are making big improvements now um, each generation. So you can sort of expect that they're only going to get closer and closer. Yeah. And do you mean the cameras bit is interesting there because I feel like OnePlus has been making a big play about its cameras for a long time. Do you feel like it's getting closer to being in the conversation about the best camera phone? I think Huawei probably still is... is maybe the leader with Samsung and kicking around an app. I mean, like every time I think about it, like I've been to the Apple labs for cameras. We've seen what Samsung can do. Like every brand has got their own now sort of idea of what the best camera is. But I'd say those three are the ones that are really doing things that, like it depends subjectively what you prefer, but is OnePlus in the same ballpark now? Uh, it's not quite, I'd say it, it, it's still paying a little bit of catch up, but it's much closer than it was. But yeah, as you say, it, it's very subjective. Um, I've been talking to some photographer friends of mine and one of them was saying that, from a, a series of verses uh, pictures that I actually tweeted out um, between the 8 Pro, the 7 T Pro, the S20 Plus and the P30 Pro, just because that's what I had lying around. And he was saying that um, he still thinks from his sort of photography eye that the S20 Plus is still the best all round of those four particular phones. Yeah. Um, but it does really come down to personal preference. Samsung yeah. usually produces images which are a bit more uh, colourful, they pack more of a punch, um, but uh, aren't quite as close to real life. So uh, the images look more vibrant and thus initially are more visually alluring. Um, but you'll actually find that the 8 Pro takes better, closer to real life images in terms of the way it brings out the colours. So it doesn't seem maybe quite as punchy as the photos taken by the S20 Plus, but you are getting a trade off of actually it does represent what we were actually seeing for our eyes a bit more. But the zoom on the uh, on the Samsung, for example, is better. The night modes on the Huawei's are excellent, um, and, and they're better than the OnePlus as well. And in terms of availability, how easily can you get them? Uh, really easy. Now, uh, gone are the days where uh, OnePlus phones were invite only. Uh, they're available on the OnePlus website in major uh, countries, uh, markets, including the US and the UK, uh, over 20 other European countries, a variety of Asia, uh, Asia as well. Um, so it's now got an established name in the market. And while it's certainly in terms of the consumer, nowhere near as widely known as Samsung and Apple, etc., it is building that base and it is convincing stores and carriers to actually range the phones which is always difficult for a new brand and okay they're not new anymore but it shows that they've come a long way to be able to be ranged in major stores and with major carriers and that will only further enhance the uh the, the knowledge and the brand among the consumers i mean so you make a good point there about <clears throat> the fact that OnePlus isn't as well known by consumers. It does have a really good community, a lot of really uh, engaged fans who love OnePlus no matter what. It's kind of what it's built itself on. You know, Honor and Xiaomi do the same kind of thing. My worry for OnePlus is that it's now kind of in that middle ground where, you know, we've seen Sony, LG, HTC try and be the same thing. They're great brands. They've got big names behind them. They've got great specs. And yet they've all sort of fallen by the wayside. Why do you think OnePlus is still got a future i mean does it still have a future can it start to gain more ground on the top brands even if it hasn't got the same price comparison and stuff like that um 
I wouldn't say LG and Sony don't have a future, as it were. It's a challenging time, and there are clear sort of big names, especially at the top of the mobile market. It is an interesting transition for the brand, which started out producing maybe more mid-range phones in terms of pricing, and it has now transitioned now into sort of the fully flagship. So whether its fans will continue to follow it because they were drawn by the underdog sort of stance that it took, that it was heavily undercutting uh, flagship phones. And yes, there were several compromises made to produce a lower price, but they were finding the right mix of specs and design and price to encourage people to stay and buy. Um, whether it can continue to bring the fans along and whether they're fully invested enough in the brand itself rather than just the price point will be interesting to see. I think that the phone is good enough to stand on its own and to justify its price tag. If you stuck a different brand name on this phone and you put it out there and with the current price tag, you'd be like, okay, yeah, I can understand that price tag. The thing with OnePlus is that they went so heavy in the early years on price they really drove it home as we're you know so much cheaper than the big name you don't need to pay a lot for a great phone etc they went so heavy on that branding that is sort of the ideology they've put into fans minds so whether those fans are willing to shift their expectations will be interesting to see but you put a different brand on this phone uh, a high-end brand and you just go oh you know this is this much and people will be like yeah i can see that and i suppose finally do you think that <clears throat> If the, if it's about price and those fans are feeling like this isn't as good price wise as it used to be and it's not quite got the same luster um, and the specs aren't quite there, I mean, what would drive people to you know a person who's never heard of OnePlus? What would drive them to buy this phone given the fact that the price is is relatively similar? It's a it's a good looking device. Uh, it does look different. I mean, it's not reinventing the wheel when it comes to smartphone design but it does have a different look it does have a different finish the sort of matte frosted glass on the back feels great it looks different it looks shiny especially in the in the glacial green or the interstellar glow which is sort of a, a ready yellowy mix but they're eye-catching and they're a bit different to sort of just solid bold colors the screen is great especially if you like gaming or, or consuming video it's a real comfortable watch um, and the camera's for the average person, I'd say, you know, you're not going to be disappointed, especially if you're upgrading from a phone which is two plus years old. The, the difference from whatever you had then to now is still great. And you and it is just that bit cheaper than Samsung and Apple. So while the S20 and the iPhones may be stretching your budget a little much, just gives you an option where you're basically getting a full flagship phone, maybe saving yourself a little bit of money in the process and having something a bit different, you know, stand out from the crowd a bit, you know, maybe not follow the factions of people who just buy the same brand every year, try something new potentially. And one of the interesting things that we talked about the OnePlus Pro, like OnePlus 8 Pro, which I feel like is really the phone that people should be looking at if, they, if they're interested in OnePlus, but the, it's weird to think that we've got OnePlus 8 and a new iPhone out in the same week and the new iPhone is, is cheaper <laughs> than the OnePlus. Sure, but the, the new iPhone is, it, it, I wouldn't say it's a comparable device to either of the OnePlus uh, handsets. They're, they're operating in very different areas of the market. Um, I mean, straight up design-wise, the new iPhone SE uses the body of an iPhone 8, which means you've got the big bezels above and below the display. You've got the physical touch ID button on the front. Uh, there's no face ID. Uh, there's a single camera on the back. You know, it is a, it is a, it's very much a mid-range phone, which will be going up against the likes of sort of the Google Pixel 3a and 3a XL. Um, that sort of range, um, which again is decent competition for it and be interesting to see. But what's really interesting about the iPhone SE is obviously the price because it is that much cheaper than any iPhone we've seen in the last few years. And you've obviously um, spent a bit of time speaking to Apple about it. And what are you finding about the SE? Well, so for, for me, like I said, the price is, is, it is incredible in the sense of it's well, $399, £419. That, you know, if you take inflation, because that's the same price as the iPhone SE from 2016, which was a very similar device in terms of the, the methodology behind it. It took the, the shape of the uh, iPhone 5S, I think it was, yeah, um, and chucked in the iPhone 6S's uh, power and camera quality. And then it, it charged $399 for it then. And if you add inflation, that makes it $429 today. So Apple has actually launched its cheapest ever new iPhone here. And... 
<clears throat> I kind of disagree in the sense that they aren't comparable because while, yeah, the OnePlus 8 and the iPhone SE are completely different in terms of power and camera and all this kind of stuff, the thing people want with the new iPhone is that it's a new iPhone. They don't want it to be um, necessarily the best spec. They don't want it to be the highest performing in certain ways, although I'd say the A13 chipset inside, the A13 Bionic chipset inside, the iPhone 11 range and now on the SE um, is what is the possibly the most powerful on the market. So having that all together makes it sound a lot more like a, an applicable buy for people that want, like I said, a new iPhone, and especially those people who don't really care. So you're talking about people who might be a bit older, who, you know, parents often go like, well, which is the new iPhone to go for? Like three of my family have bought the iPhone SE originally based on that alone. They're like, oh, it's this one. Is it cheap? Should I buy this? And I'm like, yeah, go for it. You know, it's it's smaller. It'll fit in your hand better. And it's the difficult thing, right, is that I've often said that Apple kind of sits outside of the android phone race um, there are some comparable points and especially at the top end there's a decision between apple and samsung but for those that are embedded in the iphone ecosystem all that's there is all that's there and they don't like necessarily change so you've got the all screen front phones coming through with the 10 and 10s and the 11 range that's taken a while to get people excited about and so there starts to be this whiff of nostalgia for the home button and for the the bezels and for a phone that you can kind of wrap your hand around a little bit better even though the the 10 and the 11 are actually really easy to hold and so because of that, I think this is going to be an incredibly attractive handset. The key thing for it, for me, is going to be two things. Number one is, will the camera be any good? Because the iPhone SE from 2016 had a much better hardware set on it. It upgraded the hardware, the lenses were better, had a better sensor. It looks to me like they're very, very similar hardware on the iPhone 8 from 2017 to a 2020 model in terms of a camera. And because of that, it makes me feel a bit worried that well, let's see what Apple can do, because they're basically saying that the A13's chipset has got this really good image sensing processor. It can take images, it can improve them, it uses a neural engine to basically split up the picture into so many different ways and analyze them in a trillionth of a second or whatever, and say, like, right, there's lips, there's eyes, there's shadow in the background, let's work out what the best kind of picture should be, and puts it together really quickly, computationally, and, and makes a good picture. If it can do that, and you're getting a good new iPhone with a camera that can take good pictures, then it's an incredibly strong proposition. The only thing that sits on my mind is that battery life, because I think you reviewed the iPhone 8, didn't you, John? And you found the battery was maybe a day? Yeah, it, it, I mean, one of the historical issues with iPhones has been battery life hasn't been quite as comparable or as uh, what you'd want it to be versus Android phones. Um, but in, in the most recent years, it has improved significantly. So you're hoping that with a more efficient processor in the A13 Bionic, and you'd assume there'd be more software um, sort of efficiencies made behind the scenes as well, that the, the SE will be able to, to provide a better battery life. And I mean, we don't know under the hood what we're looking at in terms of battery size, but you never know, they may have been able to reorganize some things, maybe squeeze in a bigger battery, depending on, on what's going on. Um, but yeah, the, the operating system, iOS 13, should be more power efficient. The chipset is more power efficient. Um, and running that with, I would assume, still a, a, a relatively low-res display in, in terms of today's um, standards of displays, that should hopefully all make for a relatively good battery life performance. But again, we're not going to know until we, we get that. Yeah, and the what I find what I found really interesting was when Apple was sort of launching this whole thing, they, they made a big deal about the fact that, well, make a big deal, but the, the battery life itself will be the same as on the iPhone 8. I sort of think I agreed with you. Like we've got a much more efficient process, a much more efficient compared to to back then, which was the A12. Yes, um, was it A12 or A11? Anyway, I should know that. Um, and obviously, way way more efficient than the A9 from 2016. Um, but yeah, right. The lower res screen to what we're used to now. It's got 326 PPI. It's not even full HD um, that we see most phones with now. It's it's LCD. And like you said, I think the battery size will probably be the same. So. Combined with uh, you know a more efficient operating system, combined with the the better process, I'm not insure, entirely sure why Apple has said this. My hope is that like the iPhone XR or XR, they there's a surprise waiting because that had really good battery life for an iPhone. No one could really understand why it was sort of like <laughs> came under it came sort of under the radar. So that's pretty good. But I think yeah, Apple has kind of managed to catch itself back up again in terms of offering battery life that's comparable to to the Android phones of the world. Maybe not. You know, market leading by a long way, but we we used to you know the five, six, seven years of Apple where its battery life wasn't good enough. You know, if you were just an iPhone user, you might not have noticed, but then you went to like a Huawei Mate, for instance, and it gave you like triple the battery life or double it, and you can see there was something to make up. And Apple has done that, so let's see what happens because 
in re- under review conditions, anything could happen. But I'm surprised Apple has downplayed it. I would say that Apple do- it has started to get a history of under promising, um, just to make sure it doesn't go too far. Like the Apple Watch originally was has always been 18 hours, and I've always found that it goes longer than that, and it's nice. It's a nice surprise to have. Yeah, I think they're aware of maybe the historical criticism, maybe from from journalists and also from from the public about battery life. So yeah, you want to maybe remain cautious if you're Apple around those figures. Um, but at three nine nine dollars, it's it's a fascinating uh, product, and I, I expect it to be super popular. And it will may may well help Apple break into new markets or break into sort of more emerging markets in a bigger way with a with a new lower price tag. And yeah, it'll, it's going to be a really interesting one to watch. Yeah, I, th- I think you're right. The availability obviously will be worldwide. Um, pre-orders have gone live on the 17th of April. Um, and I think you're right about emerging markets. We saw a huge amount of interest from India, didn't we, when it went when the um, launch was happening. We saw loads of people coming over from there. Um, obviously, we've got good readership in India. Hello, if you're if you're watching. Um, but it was a much bigger spike than we expected, and it shows there is definitely some interest in this sort of lower cost iPhone in that region alone. And obviously, like I said, more around the world. Um, the key thing I think is going to be just like what what can this actually do? You know, like um, I think for me. Having a new iPhone for people is important because they, they are holding on to them for longer. I Maybe it's a year out, but I'd argue that this iPhone has been timed. It's because we've been expecting a new iPhone SE for since the last one. Like, thought, well, next year we'll get another one. Next year we'll get another one. But the special edition thing seemed to last. And so the question is, why now? Why four years later do we get a new iPhone SE? And I think it's because people who have the old one, it's just so old and it's getting so slow and the battery's probably starting to really struggle and the screens are probably smashed. And now is the time to upgrade. I would have said last year would have been the point, but people are holding on to them for longer. So you know a four-year cycle is quite interesting and let's see if it can hold up because the great thing is now with the a13 processor the upgrades to ios we can probably see this getting upgraded for at least four more years if not five six um and that's a really great thing in terms of people wanting to hold on to their devices absolutely yeah i mean i, I guess the only question mark is is no 5g but again it's the cheaper iphone and 5g networks aren't ubiquitous yet even in sort of developed areas so it's no surprise that Apple is holding off that particular train while others are trying to jump on it because, yeah, 5G for most people isn't a pull at the moment to buy a phone, um, but it does give you a little bit of future-proofing. But it'll be interesting to see maybe with the uh, development of 5G whether that encourages Apple maybe in two years to reboot the SE just so it can do a 5G version. I, mean, I, I don't really feel like that 5G is going to become a thing, like, I mean, like a must-have thing for I don't know, five years t- at least because – you know, we're, we're, the, the addition of 4G took a while to roll through. And I think 5G, it depends what it does, basically. Like, it, we, we know it could be game-changing, but until it is, then the budget phone end of things especially, which Apple is, you know, playing in now in theory, um, doesn't necessarily need it. So I feel like if this had been the first 5G phone, it would, would have been weird for Apple. Like, we probably think that the iPhone 12 later this year will have it, but to have it in this early model would be would be pretty strange. But I'm interested to see what happens. Like I said, I think the SE devices are, are a really good strand for Apple. I was looking back over the iPhone 5C from 2013, which was the first attempt at a cheaper iPhone, and um, that was terrible. You know, it was a classic phone. It didn't look, it didn't look great. It was colourful, fine, but it had you know eight gig of space at the bottom end, and quite quickly that would get filled up, and then you couldn't install updates without connecting it to a laptop, and it was just ah, oh, that was terrible. And that was you know equivalent of about seven hundred pounds now or seven hundred dollars. Um, so Apple's definitely moving in the right direction in terms of servicing a need for for cheaper models. Like you said, it just depends on whether recycling old designs and and whether it can do that power efficiency and all that kind of stuff will will actually resonate with consumers. Absolutely, I agree. <laughs> and we agree. Um, do you feel that the that the time is right for any more new phones at the moment? I mean, we're in a sort of quiet period now. OnePlus tends to be one of the, the last launches of the sort of first half of the year. Um, there are rumours that maybe we'll see one or two more um, by the end of May. Um, but we'll see. But the likelihood is you're not going to see any other major phone launches now until the end of August at the earliest where we would expect the new Galaxy Note series from Samsung to come out. Whether or not that goes ahead, it, it's difficult to predict anything at the moment. The The state of the world changes week to week uh, and it's having a knock-on effect onto supply chains and manufacturing. 
uh, onto people's incomes and thus disposable cash that they have to, to buy things. So are, are people as willing to buy a new smartphone right now? There are more important things for us to focus on, uh, especially when it comes to what to spend our money on. So it, it's going to be an interesting time for the mobile market. We may see a quieter extended period than what we're used to. Um, but I think things will still keep going. I mean, you know, Apple could have held the SE till the September and launch it alongside the 12 if it really thought uh, launching it now would hamper its reach or if it thought it couldn't produce enough units um, and September would give it more lead time. But it's done it and, and a number of other companies have done virtual launches over the past sort of six to eight weeks. So the machine keeps rolling. Um, I expect, you know, Samsung and Apple and Google and Huawei even to launch other major phones at the back end of this year. Whether or not availability will be as great or or whether actual people will want to buy them as quickly yeah. will be interesting to monitor. Um, and yeah, it may mean that we see uh, smaller ranges from firms. Um, HMD Global, who make Nokia phones, they tend to launch quite a few phones every year, uh, a really broad range. But I wouldn't be surprised if they sort of dial back maybe on some of their sort of more mid-range models just to really focus on a few handsets, um, again, to help their manufacturing side, but also to sort of appease uh, users who, you know, we're not in a time where we need to be bombarded with with multiple variants of various phones. We're in a time where maybe clarity is better. Absolutely, yeah. Um, well, thank you, John. I thought that was a fun chat. Um, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Going down phone memory lane with you. Um, we've been doing this for a while, haven't we? It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good one. Um, well, thanks very much, and thank you all for watching. Um, we really appreciate you watching this episode of Tech Radar Talks, um, and we'll speak to you all hopefully very soon. Bye. Bye.